um, lovely day today with East Hampton Library. Um, today we're going to have a discussion of Jeffrey Sussman's latest book, um, Boxing and the Mafia, The Notorious History of the Sweet Science. Um, if you're not familiar with the term the sweet science, it, as Joan Baum mentioned in her review, it turns up quite a lot in boxing. And uh, goes back to A.J. Liebling, who Jeffrey will talk a little bit about. There is a lot of excellent history in this book from individuals. It reads like a who's who. <laughs> so uh, sit back, relax, and then afterwards, after the talk, we'll do a little Q&A time, and I'll turn it over to Jeffrey Sussman. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Nice to have such a, a good turnout today. Um, a, a number of people asked me how I got interested in uh, boxing and mob together. And when, when I was uh, uh, 13 years old, my father introduced me to an uncle of his, uh, a man named Ergen Kershaw, who I'd never met before, and I never saw again after that, who was a very successful bootlegger uh, during the 1920s. And, and made millions of dollars from bootlegging. And he was a partner of a, uh, of a New Jersey gangster named Alongis uh, Wilman. And, and Irving also was one of five people who were indicted but never tried for the murder of a gangster named uh, a Dutch Schultz because they, they were um, competitors uh, in uh, the illegal booze business uh, during Prohibition. But uh, after uh, I met Irving, I asked my father about this man and, and what his relationship was. And he said, uh, during the 1930s, during the Great Depression, my father's family was rather poor. And Irving was very, very wealthy. He had a big mansion uh, uh, adjacent to April Harriman's mansion in upstate New York. And while he didn't do anything to help out my father's family financially, he gave my father a lot of tips uh, on fixed fights. And, and he knew about it. And he would tell my father, well, look, bet $75 on this cap with uh, Primo Carnera or Jack Sharpie, and you'll win $750 or $1,000. And if you save the $1,000 and bet that on the next fixed fight, you know, maybe you'll walk away with $5,000 or, or $8,000. And so my father was fascinated by that, and he told me that story. And I became fascinated <coughs> by... Uh, how boxing matches were fixed. And in the uh, uh, 1980s, uh, I did the publicity for a, uh, an Olympic gold medalist who was a welterweight fighter named Howard Davis. And I used to go watch uh, Howard at the Times Square gym, which is a boxing gym on West 42nd Street that's no longer there. And I got to talking to some of the people in the gym. They were very colorful characters. And I, I asked one of them about fixed fights, and he said, you know, we no longer have to fix the boxer. All we have to do is fix one of the judges, or maybe two of them, <laughs> and, 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 and we'll know the outcome. And, and he said, you know, God forbid that our fighter is losing, and it looks like he may be knocked out, the referee, who has also been paid off, will make sure to keep separating the fighters so that the, the, the guy we want to, uh, to lose doesn't land an accidental knockout punch. And um, uh, in, in the uh, final chapter of my book, I have testimony from uh, uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano, who testified uh, uh, to a Senate committee about corruption in boxing. And he said, well, what would happen if uh, your man uh, that you wanted to, to, to lose accidentally knocked out his opponent? And he said, well, our man would quickly pick him up and make sure that he started fighting him. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but uh, fighting goes back to um, Arnold Rothstein. He was the man who uh, allegedly fixed uh, the 1919 World Series. And th there was a lot of notoriety that came from that uh, event. And he and his bagman, a uh, featherweight boxing champion uh, named Abe Attell, realized that it was a lot easier to fix a boxing match than to fix a baseball game. In baseball, you had to fix almost nine players. In boxing, only one or two uh, participants needed to be fixed. So Abe Attell 
uh, after the 1919 World Series and after that fiasco. Oh, by, by the way, he was uh, tried in a court for, for his work in fixing the 1919 World Series. And, 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 and the guy had uh, so much moxie that he convinced the jury that he was the wrong A to tell. <laughs> and, and, and they dismissed him. <laughs> um, but but Ava Kell then went to work for a, uh, a famous gangster named Oni Madden. Oni Madden, who had also been one of the biggest bootleggers in New York in the 1920s, and was known as Oni the Killer Madden because he had killed a number of people during his rise in, in, in crime. But after Prohibition ended, he was looking for other ways of making a living. And not that he needed to, I mean, he had made millions of dollars, but uh, he decided that boxing w would be a good ticket for him. And he bought a, a contract of a, uh, a heavyweight boxer uh, named Primo Carnera. Now, Primo Carnera was originally a, a circus strongman from Italy, and his uh, manager was a, a Frenchman who brought him to New York and only saw the potential of Primo Carnera, and he pushed the manager out with threats and sent him back to France and took over the contract of uh, Primo Carnera. Primo Carnera was enormous. He was six foot seven and, and weighed about 270 pounds, but he couldn't box. Uh, he, he, he looked like a boxer. He was immensely strong, had a, a terrific physique. And so in order to get him to get the, the uh, World Heavyweight Championship, they had to fix all of his fights. So every fighter he fought got paid off to lose to, to a, a Primo Carnera. And eventually, in 1935, he fought uh, Max Baer. And uh, Oni Madden's uh, henchman uh, came into Max Baer's uh, dressing room prior to the fight, and they wanted him to throw the fight. And he had a very tough manager named Ansel Hoffman, who told these thugs to get lost. And nothing happened, uh, oddly enough. And uh, Max Baer knocked out Primo Carnera and became the heavyweight champion of the world. Uh, after that, Oni Madden continued uh, doing some Ill Ill illegal stuff and then retired to Hot Springs, Arkansas. And he turned Hot Springs, Arkansas into a resort for criminals and, 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 and gangsters who were on the lam so that uh, Lucky Luciano hid out there when, when Thomas Dewey was looking to uh, convict him. Uh, uh, Frank Costello went there. Um, uh, there was a, a guy named uh, Mad Dog Call, who, 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 who was uh, wanted for murder in New York. He went there. Um, and Oni Madden married the uh, postmaster's daughter in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And Eventually, as in, in old age, as he became quite ill, he needed round-the-clock nursing care. And his round-the-clock nurse in Hot Springs, Arkansas, was Bill Clinton's mother, <laughs> who, who took very good care of him and it, uh, un, un, until he died. Now, now the, the next person who came and, and really started controlling illegal sports, particularly boxing, in New York was a man named Frankie Carbo, who had been a murderer of murdering and, and had killed probably 19 people. And the, uh, the head of the Philadelphia uh, Mafia in the 1970s, a man named uh, Ralph Natale, said that it was well known in the mob that uh, Frankie Carbo had been the trigger man who killed Bugsy Siegel in, in Beverly Hills in 1947. Now, uh, Frankie Carbo was also known as Mr. Gray and, and, and other uh, strange names because he sort of hid in the shadows. But he had a partner named uh, Frank Blinky Palermo, who was the numbers king of Philadelphia. And Frankie was a promoter. And, and, if, if you, and they also teamed up with a man named Jim Norris, who came from an extremely wealthy family in Chicago. They owned the Chicago Merchandise Mart. At the time, they owned a number of hockey and basketball teams and, and, and a local baseball team. But uh, Jim Norris was fascinated by the underworld, and he loved hanging around boxers and the gangsters who were involved in, in boxing. And he uh, became the head of uh, Madison Square Garden. And in partnership with Frankie Carbo and Frank Palermo, they were able to control every single boxing match that took place in Madison Square Garden. 
And they would determine who would win and who would lose. And they would bet on, on, on the outcome of the fight, knowing what the outcome of the fight would be. Um, uh, uh, Frankie Carbo uh, uh, was the man who got uh, uh, Jake LaMotta to give up a fight against a man named uh, Billy Fox so that uh, Jake LaMotta could get a shot at the middleweight uh, boxing title. And uh, Jake LaMotta was so upset about this that when he fought Billy Fox, he really didn't put up a defense. And everyone who saw the fight realized that he wasn't defending himself. And they were yelling from the stands. All the audience was yelling, fix, fix, and, 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 and other things. And uh, it was uh, Jake's opportunity to get a shot at the uh, middleweight title. It, since Jake knew that he was going to uh, lose the fight, and Frankie Carbo paid him $100,000 to lose it, uh, Jake LaMotta bet $100,000 on his opponent. A and, and, and the odds were, were such that uh, uh, Jake really cleaned up on that fight. He had uh, six more fights after that, and he finally got a shot at the middleweight title against a, a French uh, a middleweight named Marcel Serdan. And uh, Jake won and became the middleweight uh, boxing champion. You, you probably have seen this in the movie Raging Bull. Uh, there was supposed to be a rematch with uh, Jake LaMotta and Marcel Sudan, but uh, Sudan's plane coming back from France uh, crashed in the Azores and he died. He was incidentally the uh, fiancé of the famous French singer Edith Piaf, and they, they were supposed to get married. And, and the reason he was flying to New York rather than taking a boat is because he wanted to be able to spend time with Edith Piaf prior to, uh, to his match with uh, Jake LaMotta. Had he taken a boat, he would have survived, unfortunately. Um, uh, Frankie um, uh, Carbo wanted to take over a, uh, I think he was a, a middleweight boxer in Los Angeles uh, named uh, uh, Don Jordan. And, and he had a manager named uh, Jackie Leonard. And he and Frank Palermo were threatening uh, uh, Jackie Leonard that if they didn't sign a contract, sign over their contract to them to manage and promote uh, a Don Jordan, they would kill him. And, and the Los Angeles cops didn't want to do anything to help him. And so he went to the FBI, and the FBI wired him. And he got all these threats down on tape. And finally, the, uh, the FBI brought these tapes to uh, Robert Kennedy, who was then the Attorney General of the United States. And they, they went to prosecute him, uh, Frank Palermo, uh, Frankie Carbo, Jim Norris and, and other uh, men associated with them. Frankie Carbo was given a, a 25 years in prison, and uh, Palermo was given 15 years. Uh, uh, Jim Norris, probably because of his political connections and his wealth, got probation and, and, and went back to Chicago <laughs> as his lawyer. Uh, as a man named Truman Gibson, who, who was an interesting character. He, he was a close friend of Joe Lewis and managed Joe Lewis's career. He had been hired by Franklin Roosevelt to help integrate the army after the end of World War II. He, he was an icon in the civil rights movement, but under all of this, he was a gangster and, 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 and a, a good partner of uh, Carbo and Palermo and Norris. And he, too, uh, uh, got off because of his political connections. He did not have to do any jail time. The, uh, nevertheless, while they were in prison, uh, uh, Frankie Carbo and Frank Palermo were also controlling Sonny Liston. <coughs> and at, at, along with some other uh, of the mobsters, it, it was amazing how many mobsters owned different pieces of Sonny Liston. 5% here, 10% there, 20% there. Uh, a, uh, the head of the, the mob in St. Louis, a man named John Vitale, owned 15% uh, of, of Sonny Liston, and a gangster gambler in uh, Las Vegas named Ash Resnick also on 20% of uh, Sonny Liston. And, and, and there's been a lot of controversy about whether Sonny Liston's fights with Muhammad Ali were fixed or not. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, uh, the first fight in, 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 in Miami, uh, Sonny Liston couldn't come out of his corner at the end of the seventh round because he couldn't use one arm. And everyone thought that he was faking. But uh, three days later, x-rays were done of his arm, and it turned out that he had severe injuries in his shoulder, and it had bled into his bicep, and in fact, he couldn't use uh, his, his arm. 
the, the second fight, uh, the rematch, took place in Lewiston, Maine, which is a little town that nobody had ever heard of. And, and that was because the promoters couldn't get a big city to, uh, to offer a, a venue for a rematch between uh, Liston and Ali. They tried uh, New York, they tried Chicago, they tried Philadelphia, and the mayors of all of those cities said no, uh, because Sonny Liston was known as, 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 as a gangster, and he was a gangster, and, but he had a very sad life also. Um, Sonny Liston was one of uh, 25 children uh, uh, of a, a, a sharecropper named uh, uh, Toby Liston. His, his father used to beat him all the time with, with a stick, with, with a leather strap, with, with a, a branch from a tree. And uh, Sonny Liston's back was covered with scars uh, uh, from this. Uh, he ran away from home when he was uh, 15 and went to Chicago because his mother had left Toby because she was being beaten up by Toby as well. And uh, Sonny Liston, uh, because he lived on a little uh, farm in, in, in Kentucky, he thought that Chicago was just like a, a, a little town in, in Kentucky. And he kept asking strangers on the street if they knew his mother. Uh, and of course they didn't. And <coughs> the cops found him one night sleeping in an alley amidst garbage cans. And uh, they, they took him to jail, and they fed him, and they, they cleaned him up and they, they found out he was looking for his mother, and they were able to locate his mother, and they reunited uh, Sonny with his mother. Sonny was very big at the time. Uh, at, at, at age uh, 15, he was about six feet four, and, and, and um, uh, he went to school, but all the kids used to make fun of him because he was, he was so big, and he quit school, and he was completely illiterate. He could neither read nor write, and he took odd jobs, but he, then he also joined gangs and he was committing crimes. He, he was a mugger. He was known as the, uh, the yellow shirt bandit of, of Chicago because foolishly he always wore a yellow shirt when he mugged <laughs> someone. And all you had to do was look for a kid with a yellow shirt and, and you knew who he was and they arrested him. <laughs> but, but, but he was such a, a tough guy that when the cops would beat him over the head with, with a club, it, it didn't seem to have any effect on him. I mean, I mean you could punch this kid, you could pummel him. And, 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 and he just came back for more. He, he was just extraordinary. And he was in prison, and a priest in prison tried to reform him and, and encouraged him to become a, a boxer. And, and Sonny and this priest remained uh, friends for the rest of uh, Sonny's life. Uh, he, he had a number of fights, and he won every single fight. And, and he was fearsome. He was probably one of the most powerful heavyweight fighters who ever lived. People were terrified of him. They'd get in the ring with him, and they'd want to get out of the ring with him as soon as possible. He, he was really fearsome. And, uh, but the, the mob controlled and, 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 and owned him. They saw Sonny as a terrific needle picker. And, and as long as he kept winning, they were winning as, as, as well. However, when it came to Muhammad Ali, the, there were a lot of people who did not want Sonny Liston to become the heavyweight champion. That included uh, John and Robert Kennedy. They thought he was bad for the black race. Uh, the NAACP didn't want him to become uh, the, the heavyweight champion. The um, Congress of Racial Equality didn't want him to become the heavyweight champion. They thought he would just be a terrible example for uh, the black community in the United States. They all wanted Muhammad Ali, who was then known as Cassius Clay, uh, uh, to become the heavyweight champion. He was handsome, he was witty, uh, people liked him. Uh, he was an attractive personality. So uh, the, the mob figured, you know, if, if, if Sonny loses, even though he's the favorite, and we bet on, on Cassius Clay to win, we, we can make a fortune. So uh, prior to the fight in Lewiston, a friend of John Vitale in St. Louis said, I'm going to fly up to Lewiston uh, to see this fight. And John Vitale said to his uh, pal, who was a captain in, in, in Vitaly's crime family, he said, don't bother going, it's going to be over before you get there. And, and a, a close friend of Ash Resnick, who was a mobster in Las Vegas, said the same thing to Ash. He said, I'm going to go up and see the fight in, in Lewiston. And Ash said, it's going to be over in the first round. Before you even get into your seat, the fight's going to be over. Now, supposedly, Muhammad Ali hit 
uh, Sonny Liston wrote what was called the Phantom Punch. I think it was a minute and 44 seconds into the first round. And no one saw this punch. A and yet, Sonny Liston went down and he rolled over a few times and then he landed on his back. And there's a famous photograph of uh, Muhammad Ali standing over him, mm -hmm. looking at him. What a lot of people don't know is that Muhammad Ali is yelling at Sonny, saying to him, Get up, sucker. Get up, sucker. No one's going to believe this. No one's going to believe I hit you. Get up. <laughs> and, 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 and the referee sends uh, Muhammad Ali back to his corner. And Muhammad Ali says to his cornerman, did I hit him? I don't think I hit him. Did I hit him? So he, he, he didn't believe me. He didn't get Sonny Liston. Uh, so so th that was the end of uh, Sonny Liston's. And he had two more bouts after that. Uh, no importance. And, uh, but... but Muhammad Ali went on to have a great career after that. I don't think Muhammad Ali knew the fight was fixed um, because um, they didn't need to inform him of it. Uh, they just needed to fix Sonny Liston, and that was that. And, and also, you know, people who admired uh, Muhammad Ali and thought he was a great American icon do not want to accept the fact that either of those two fights were fixed because they think that it's somehow injurious to the reputation of Muhammad Ali that he won. A, 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 a fixed fight in order to become a heavyweight champion. But it isn't true, really, because he did perform magnificently in subsequent fights and, 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 and proved what a great fighter he was. But uh, Sonny Liston then had a very unfortunate end. Uh, there are no, he was killed in, in, in his home in Las Vegas, and there are several theories about why he was killed. One theory was that the mob didn't pay him all the money uh, that they owed him, and he was demanding it. And he said that if he didn't get it, he was going to go to the FBI. Another theory was that he was, um, he, he became a heroin addict. And, and incidentally, he was taking heroin with Joe Lewis that was shooting it up together. And, and, and um, uh, the mob who controlled the heroin distribution in Las Vegas were angry at Sonny Liston because they felt he was impinging on their territory and they wanted to get rid of him. And what, what the, um, the uh, more the medical examiner determined after they found Sonny's body what was that uh, someone had uh, doped him. They had friends perhaps had come into his house, given him uh, alcohol, but the alcohol was doped and, and it, it knocked him out. And, and once he was knocked out, they injected him with an overdose of heroin, a hot shot of heroin that he overdosed on and killed him. What was interesting. Is, is, is that initially the publicity in Las Vegas was that Sonny Liston accidentally killed himself by giving himself an overdose of heroin. Sonny Liston had a morbid fear of needles. He would never go near a needle. And, 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 and yet they found a needle sticking out of his arm and a needle in his back. So if, if he was a man who did everything possible to avoid getting shot with a needle, he, he couldn't possibly have uh, injected himself with an overdose of, of, of heroin. Now, in, in uh, 1993, uh, the U.S. Senate decided to have a, a, a hearing on uh, a corruption in, in, in boxing. And uh, they called uh, Sammy de Bull who at the time was in the Witness Protection Program, <coughs> having testified against uh, John Gotti. And one of the things they asked uh, Bourbano was, uh, are fights still fixed the same way they had been fixed? In other words, do we, do we pay a judge? Do we pay a referee? Uh, do, do we pay one boxer to take a dive? And Gravano said, no, we don't do that anymore. He said, because there's so much money involved in boxing, tens of millions of dollars, we don't have to do that. Regardless of who wins or loses, we're going to make tens of millions of dollars on, 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 on these fights. He said, what, what we tend to do <coughs> is, is, is we spot a fighter who we think is an up-and-coming fighter, somebody who uh, has the potential <coughs> to, to being a champion. And we'll uh, get him a trainer. He won't know that the mob owns him. Uh, we'll, we'll own his trainer. We'll own his manager. And, and, and we'll pay for all of his training. And we'll pay for all of his management. And, and those people will have contracts with us. And, and then we're going to make sure that he has fights with other fighters that he wins. Not by fixing them, but by having him fight people who are not as good as he is, and, and, and therefore we know what the outcome is going to be. 
And because there are so many sanctioning bodies, what we'll do is we're going to pay off a sanctioning body to make our fighter a top contender. So, for example, he mentioned that at the time they, were, they had a, a, a heavyweight boxer from Italy who uh, subsequently had some health problems and, and, and dropped out of boxing. But at the time, they wanted to make him a heavyweight champion. And they went to uh, one of the sanctioned bodies, and they asked that this guy be pushed to the top of the field, that he would become the next contender for the heavyweight boxing championship. And they said, well, we'll cost you $10,000. And he said, well, you know, I'm here on behalf of John Gotti. And they said to him, well, as a courtesy to John Gotti, we'll make it $5,000. And, and, and so they paid the $5,000. And he said, but that's how we would control boxing. Because by the time that that guy got to be a contender fighting for the world championship through closed circuit television and all kinds of promotional deals, the fight would be worth tens of millions of dollars. And we would clean up on that. It really, I mean, we would like him to be the winner, but even if he didn't win, we would clean up on it. And, and we also have in the contract that there would be a rematch. So the rematch would be worth tens of billions of dollars. And he said, the fixing of, of boxing, or the control, the mob's control of boxing, is so subtle now that most people are unaware of, 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 of how it's controlled. And, uh, and, and, and that's where we stand today. Anyway, that's my story of, of, of boxing and the mob. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, please ask me questions. Are you familiar with uh, Jose Torres? Yes. And his fight against Charlie Devil Green? No, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, it's a very interesting story. Uh, uh, Charlie Devil Green was a light heavyweight uh, Olympic champion. Jose Torres had retired and was making his comeback. And uh, the guy he was supposed to fight uh, came up lame the day of the fight. So Charlie Green, who was in the audience, was pulled out of the audience and paid the biggest payday he ever got, which was $50,000, to fight, to fight Jose Torres. And uh, this is apropos of what you say, people wanting certain people to win. In the first round, Charlie Green knocked Torres out, but there was a long, a, the, the mirror reported that they counted to 25, <laughs> <laughs> and, and Torres got up, and Charlie knocked him down again, <laughs> and Torres got up at the count of 14, <laughs> and in the third round, he knocked Charlie out because he had been training, and Charlie uh, hadn't been training, right. so that, That's obviously funny. they wanted Jose to, of course. <laughs> and to his credit, after that fight, Jose Torres retired. Oh, he did. <laughs> yes. Was the original uh, match spelling Joe Lewis fight fixed? No, I don't think so. But what, what, you know, what a lot of people don't know is that, you know, that was in, I think, uh, 1939. Right. But, you know, th there was a fight with Max Baer and uh, uh, Max Schmeling in 1933, which didn't get very much publicity. And it was the year that Hitler came to power. And uh, Ma Max Baer was partially Jewish. Mm -hmm. He had a Jewish father. Um, and <coughs> he didn't know much about Hitler or, or what was going on in Germany at the time. But his manager did a man named Ansel Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And he told uh, 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 Max Baer about this. And so Max Baer put a uh, Star of David on, on his boxing trunks. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fight took place at Yankee Stadium. My, my, my father was there and told me about it. And Max Baer so pummeled Max Schmeling that the referee had to stop the fight in the tenth round, saying that, that if he hadn't stopped it, um, Max Baer would have killed Max Schmeling. And, and you can see this fight on YouTube. Wow. It's extraordinary. And 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 and, and that uh, Max Schmeling was thought of as, 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 as such a great fighter. He, he wasn't. When you see him in this fight, I mean, he was he was taking one punch after another from the beginning of round one. He, he, he was just <coughs> trying to stand on his feet for the ten rounds. It was extraordinary. How long did it take you to research all this? Uh, about six or seven months. Did you get any threats? No. Well, most of these people are dead. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so when do you think 
to have not yet exited from boxing, or did they exit, or does it still go on? Well, according to Sammy Gravano, it still goes on, but it goes on in such subtle ways that the public... So you think even today, a lot of these fights are so big? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, 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 do you remember that fight with, with uh, what's his name, Floyd Mayweather and, and, uh, yes. and, and that other the guy? I mean, it was a $10 million joke. Uh, uh, you know, his, his opponent w w was, was no match for him. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's show business. And, and, and it's not quite wrestling, but it's definitely show business. Do you think when the judges sometimes have such disparity in a fight, Every judge scores a lopsided one, and then there's one who's completely different in the opposite direction. Is that an accident, or is that an attempt to do something? I think it's probably an attempt to do something. I, I, I did a radio interview uh, about a month ago with a man named Randy Gordon, who's the former New York State Boxing Commissioner, and um, a man named Jerry Cooney, who had been a, a yeah. heavyweight boxer. And we were talking about that. And, w and one of the things that we all agreed what was that, you know, the audience will see that a fighter has definitely won, and yet the judges and the referee pick his opponent as, as the winner on points. And, 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 and there can only be one conclusion to that. You, you know, that, that there's an investment in, in a particular fighter winning. <coughs> what about the fights with uh, Evander Holyfield? The reason I ask that is because the class name of uh, my daughter's was uh, the father was the, his manager. And I always wondered about that. I never asked him. But uh, the event that Holyfield fights in general, how are they? I, I, as far as I know, they're legitimate. Were they? Okay. As far as I know, yeah. yeah. <coughs> the first uh, Walter Lewis fight, Lewis lost very badly. They got the decision. Was there any? <laughs> was there any? But, well, it was very interesting. There was a man named uh, Mike Jacobs who preceded uh, uh, Frankie Carbo. In, in controlling Madison Square Garden. He wasn't quite a gangster, but, but he wasn't on the level either. A and he had a contract with, with uh, Joe Lewis. Well, well, for any fight that took place at Madison Square Garden had to go through Mike Jacobs. And he had a contract, a lifetime contract with Joe Lewis, that as long as Joe Lewis was the heavyweight champion of the world, he would get 10% of Joe Lewis's earnings for ad infinitum. So uh, Max Baer <coughs> fought uh, uh, Joe Lewis. Max Baer at the time had two broken hands. And, and the fight took place at Yankee Stadium, an outdoor fight. And because his, uh, his, both of his fists were broken, a doctor injected them with Novocaine mm -hmm. so he would be able to fight. But it was raining that night, and the rain didn't stop till 11 o'clock at night. The fight was originally supposed to take place around 7.30 at night. And by the 11 o'clock at night, nobody came to the war and all. And, and, and Max Fair went out and, and he was slaughtered uh, by Joe Lewis. He couldn't defend himself. Six months later, uh, his, his right hand, he had one of the hardest punching right hands uh, of any heavyweight uh, boxer. His right hand was completely repaired. And he wanted a rematch. And Mike Jacobs would not give him a rematch with Joe Lewis because he was frightened that uh, Max Fair would knock out uh, uh, Joe Lewis. All he needed was one terrific right punch and he would do it. Um, so he refused to have that rematch and it also protected his investment in Joe Lewis. So was the Walker fight fixed? It could be. It, it very well could be. Two questions if you allow me. The, the, uh, what is illegal then with what the uh, mob does presently? With the, the large numbers that are involved with it? Well, it, they're not doing things that are so much illegal anymore. Uh, I mean, it was illegal to fix a fight, it was illegal to threaten someone, it was illegal to buy off any, uh, uh, a referee or a judge. But, but, if, but if you own something that's legitimate and, and, and you're not doing anything illegitimate, um, the, the only thing that is probably illegitimate is paying off one of the um, sanctioning bodies to elevate your fighter to a position of being a contender. The ones who have the 10,000? Yeah. That, I mean, that's illegal. Uh, um, on whose part? I, 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 well, it's, it's illegal on the part of the sanctioning body, and, and it's complicit on the part of the, the, the management that, that, that pays them. Uh, the second question is, during the fight and uh, on a point system, are those individual rounds recorded at the end of the round, or are they all tallied 
signed at the end of the fight? Um, you, usually, in, 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 in going far back, it, it was tallied along the way. I mean, because you couldn't keep track of. of now they, they have recording devices that record the number of <coughs> punches on the each round. And that's what they base it on? Uh, it's well, well, that's part of what they base it on, yeah. Some clarification. What's a sanctioning body? Oh, it's like the, let's say the World Boxing Association. The, the World Boxing Association. They, they're the ones who determine if, if you fight under their label um, and, and you become a heavyweight champion, then in their body you become the heavyweight champion. But there may be another sanctioning body that doesn't recognize you. They have their own heavyweight champion. The, the, the fight that took place last week between Anthony Joshua and uh, Ruiz. Uh, Anthony Joshua had four uh, heavyweight uh, uh, belts, and because he lost the, the, the title, the four heavyweight belts w w went to his opponent. Which is a change from the glory days of boxing, where there was just one second. Exactly, fight. exactly. Right. It's about the money. Excuse me? It's about the money. But the, the, the money was just terrific. Do you, do you recall the Lever Robinson body Levine fight? No. Bobby Levine was the heaviest puncher in no way to do it. He knocked out Robinson. The lights went out. So you couldn't count it to 50. You <laughs> picked up Robinson, and the lights went out, brought it back to the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and Bobby lost the fight. But, but th th they were. They were <laughs> it, 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 my, my previous book was biography of, uh, of Rocky Graziano, and who, who was a very good uh, boxer, not great, a, a very good fighter, but not a great boxer. Uh, he wasn't a scientific boxer. He, he was really a slugger. But, but uh, he had two fights that raised some questions. One was with a man named Steve Riccio. He lost both times <coughs> to Steve Riccio, and Steve Riccio suddenly retired from boxing and became a taxi driver. Uh, his sons, by the way, are the ones who, who owned Barnes & Noble. Uh, the Riccio brothers. Oh, my yeah, God. Right. Yeah. And, and, and then he, he fought a man named Henry Green. Uh, and he had three fights with Henry Green. Mm -hmm. He lost the first two, and he won the third. And Henry Green retired from boxing after that and said that he was told he better lose because the people who were backing, uh, backing Rock <coughs> wanted him to go all the way and become a middleweight boxing champion. So he was the guy that was fought with the first time, Harold Green, and knocked him out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you tell us more or anything about the Johansson Patterson era? I, 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 I think that was a legitimate fight. The, the, uh, however, it, it, um, after Frankie Carbo was sent to prison, uh, a man named Roy Cohn and his cohorts bought what was left of the International Boxing Club, which was the, the organization owned by Frankie Carbo. And it became, I think it was called the, the 20th Century something or other. And they uh, wanted uh, Floyd Patterson. Uh, uh, to, to become a champion. I remember as a kid, though, when uh, you know the word was that when he lost to Johansson, that uh, he was owned by Salerno at the time. He was, and, and Salerno was a client, a law client of of, of, um, Roy, Cohn. of, of Roy Cohn, a, a, a very good friend of mine, um, uh, who went to Fordham Law School. Got out of Fordham Law School. His first job is before he went out on his own. He's working for Roy Cohn. And he used to tell me about Salerno coming up to the office and saying, you know, I'm really a good guy. I don't know why people are bothering me. You know, they think I'm a gangster. I'm not a, he said, I'm just a you know, lovable old man. And he said that, that, that um, uh, um, Roy Cohn, um, uh, remember uh, Fugazi, the yeah. limousine company? Yeah. He was also a partner of Roy Cohn uh, in, 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 in this. And, <coughs> And Tony Salerno were all in, in this company that in, in fact owned uh, Floyd Patterson or were controlling that fight. Whoa. Yes? Where's Mike Tyson going? He, he was a good fighter. He was a tough man. He, 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 was, uh, he started out as a street thug and he had a very good manager who converted yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you know, it's hard to escape your past. But as, as a fighter, he was a very good fighter. He was very compelling, very tough. And can you comment on, a little off topic, but 
The whole rocky phenomenon. What, what is that about? You mean the movies? Yes. Um, it, 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 it was to some extent based on this guy, Jerry Coon, um, who, who, who I did the, the radio interview with, who, who, who's a very uh, likable, very smart uh, 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 guy. And um, it, 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 it's, um, it, 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 it was basically that they romanticized his story and, and, and it became a vehicle for Sylvester Stallone. What happened to Julio? He just fizzled out. What well, he had all this talent. What happened? Um, he wa watched a couple of uh, uh, big fights, and he, he also realized that uh, you know he had gone as far as he could as, 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 as a boxer, and, and that opportunities for him lay in other directions. He's a smart guy. I mean, I know <coughs> why do I hope? Excuse me. He was the great White Hope. He was, but but that that was sort of a promotional joke. Uh, yeah. And, and, and um, uh, he, he lives in New Jersey now. He he, he shows no signs of, of having been a boxer. You know, there are no scars on his face. He's mentally alert. He, 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 he's smart, and, and he seems to be doing quite well. You say that millions of dollars are involved now. In boxing, mm -hmm. any one particular fight, probably through the HBO, through all the various right. outlets. Primarily championship fights. Okay. I fail to see how, when you say that boxing is still controlled to some extent by the mob, I, I, I can't see how they are infiltrated in this. If you say every, all the venues are legal, or licenses are legal, all the things that people do. The mob does things that are legal also. What's that? I, I, the mob does things that are legal. I, I, you know, you know, a, a, a lot of the, the mafia families—they own a lot of legal businesses. Okay, so so this step back there in the shadows that you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Right. Yes. Am I right to infer from something you said that these arrangements were made when they fixed the fighters by going to their dressing room minutes before the match? Or well, that that only happened with with, with, with in this uh, championship out with Max Fair. Oh. Most of the time, it would happen well before that. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it was just, th the mob was actually ambivalent of, about Primo Carnera at, 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 at that time because there was a lot of talk in, 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 in the sports world that his fights were fixed. And, and, they, and only Madden and his crowd were worried that, that government agencies were going to start coming down on them. So they were ambivalent. They, they thought they would try to fix this fight, but they couldn't fix it. They'll walk away from it. And they did walk away. They completely abandoned Primo Carnera after that. He, he was, as, as a result of that fight with Max Fair, he had a broken jaw, he had three broken ribs, he had a broken arm, in, 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 uh, a broken bone in one arm. The, um, the mob dumped him. They wouldn't pay any of his hospital bills. Max Fair paid every single hospital bill for, for Primo Carnera. And, 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 and because the mob stole all of his money, uh, Max Fair felt sorry for him and got him a job as a professional wrestler. And he was able to recoup. Uh, with the money that the mob had stolen from him, which was millions and millions of dollars. Yes? Yeah, it, it, it seems to me that the, 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 the fixes are well known uh, in the entire boxing community when, when they occur. And you've got sanctioning bodies, and you've got uh, the boxing commissioner, which is the government uh, appointment. The money has to be flowing up as well as to the boxers themselves, doesn't it? Sure, I mean, I mean, most of these boxers nowadays, you, you know, the championship boxers, they have very good lawyers, they have sports agents and so forth. In the, in the mid-1980s, I was doing the publicity for a, a, a welterweight boxer, an Olympic gold medalist named Howard Davis. He had a very good lawyer, he had a very good contract. I saw his contract, he was going to get a million dollars after a year, and he was going to invest that million dollars in a business and retire from boxing, which is what he did. But, but you know, um, in, in, in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, boxing was like the Wild West. Uh, uh, but yeah. it couldn't have happened without corruption, without the New York State Boxing Commission being in on it. Well, that's right. I, I, I mean, in, 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 my, in, in my book on Rocky Graziano... Uh, not my <laughs> right. In, in, in my book about Rocky Graziano, I have a whole chapter in there about his dealing with the Boxing Commissioner of, 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 of New York. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, the guy seemed legitimate, and, and, and yet the things that he did were so obviously illegitimate. Uh, and, and he was the boxing commissioner. You know, in a lot of places, a lot of states don't have boxing commissioners mm -hmm. or athletic commissioners either. 
and, and, and it's kind of, you know, do whatever you can get away with. There are cases of fighters who shouldn't be fighting because they've been knocked out so many times. And uh, they'll, they'll go to a state that has a different boxing commissioner than the one where they've been knocked out in, and they'll fight under a different name. And, 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 and they'll wind up being knocked out again. But, but these are people who are fighting for very low sums of money, and, and, and they have managers who just regard their uh, fighters the same way that they regard a prostitute. There, there's been a movement for many years that never took hold to uh, federalize the uh, boxing, uh, you know, have one room body federal. And it's interesting, of course, that Australia uh, how they take care of, think of boxers. There's the same movement now for horses uh, because they're dying from being drugged, and every state has its own uh, rule and stuff like that. The boxer, who is the center of everybody's attention is really the least important uh, or the least considered person in this entire uh, mixture. Well, J J J Jake Lamata said that uh, w w we're treated like old whores mm -hmm. who are, uh, no longer have any use for anyone. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very sad that, that, that that's what happens. Uh, did, you did, you want, did you imply that Bill Fugazi uh, who was involved with Roy Cohen, were they in any way connected, you think, to the mob? Or yes. They were. <laughs> <laughs> they were. Absolutely. Wow. I knew them both. I never knew that. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> and and, and um, Roy Cohen you know, had a reputation as a mob lawyer. Um, no, I knew I, I knew that, lawyer. but I didn't realize I didn't realize that they were act. I mean, you could be a mob lawyer, and not necessarily be connected to them. But I, I but but eventually, you, you, you know, you, you become involved with them. They like you. You like them. You, 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 they offer you opportunities. You take them, or you don't take them. You know, an investment here or an investment there. You know, there are all kinds of little subtle things that uh, uh, if, 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 if that go on. You, you know, Bill Fugazi, uh, I was told had a uh, private bank in, in, in Little Italy uh, at, at one point, and, and, and it was used for money laundering. And, and when the government started uh, investigating it, the bank closed up right away. Do you have any view on the, uh, the, the boxing, not the boxing, the other stuff that they fight in the uh, cage? And I don't know anything about that. Yeah. I have no interest in it. I, neither do I, but it's all over the place. It must be big money, too. I'm sure it is big money. Yes. Uh, two questions. One, uh, do you know the family that Bravo is connected to? A little Casey family. Okay. And uh, is there any evidence of uh, influence in the UFC at present? I don't know. Where did the uh, ownership of Madison Square Garden change after Bravo and those guys were out? How did Dolan come in? He came in as a close closer set? No, there wasn't. There, there have been several ownerships. In, in between. Valid and legitimate transfers? Yeah. Oh, it was? Yeah, that was one. Oh, yeah. yeah. In 1979, I was approached by a woman named Jackie Tanawanda. Do you know of her? No. She was, she thought of herself as the heavyweight champion of the world. Women's heavyweight champion of the world. You never heard of her? I'm, I'm not particularly interested in We tried to arrange a fight boxes. between her and the reigning light heavyweight champion, men light heavyweight champion, who was a Jewish guy, I can't remember his name. Ross, I can't Mike remember Ross. his name. Oh, uh, Mike Rossman from Philadelphia. Ross, that's right. right. Yeah. He tried to arrange a fight between her. She was an enormous woman. <laughs> I didn't think this was frivolous. I, mean, I saw her. I saw her fight, and she was. She might have beaten this guy. I don't know. <laughs> and we tried to get a license. In New Jersey, Jersey Joe Walcott was the commissioner at the time, and he would not uh, favor fights between men and women. <laughs> didn't give any consideration. Do you think there's any chance that that will ever come about? Who knows? Uh, 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 <laughs> we like that famous tennis match, <laughs> you know, with uh, with, with a oh, yeah. what was yeah. it? Jean King, Billie Jean King, right? Yeah. But uh, the the only female uh, boxing champion I know of 
is an Orthodox Jewish woman from Argentina who's the middleweight female boxing champion of Argentina. Uh, other than that, I have no idea. Muhammad Ali's daughter. I don't know. Is she, is she a champ? I don't know. I don't think so. Yes? The, um, <coughs> the lesser ranking bouts, were they clean so that they were going to get two fighters, boxers worked their way up through the ranks so that it eventually could be over the 30 brothers? It, you know, it really depended on, 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 on on the bouts and, and who's involved, but it, but it's certainly a lot easier to fix those lower level bouts than, than high profile ones. So they weren't really interested in seeing who could really be good boxers, then you fix it far like well, oh, well, oh, you know, it, 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 it's interesting to look at the career of Rocky Graziano, who started out as a club fighter <laughs> and was fighting in small arenas and so forth. And though he had a legitimate manager named Irving Cohn, he also had a manager named Eddie Coco, who, who, who was a, a mobster um, and, and, and who owned part of uh, Rocky Graziano. So, uh, and, 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 and the same thing with Rocky Marciano. Uh, uh, Al Wilde w w w was connected uh, to, to, to the mob and um, these people had an investment in making sure that their fighters went to the top if, if possible. Was he approached? Marciano ever approached? I don't think he he hung out with a lot of monsters. He was very friendly with a lot of monsters. But his his uh, manager Al Wild was very connected with the monsters. You know, all the names that you're saying are either Italian names or Jewish names. Right. Can you talk about that a little bit and how these guys get together and Well, you, you know, it's funny, I'm, I'm I'm currently writing a book about the history of the mob in, in, and, and uh, beginning with Arnold Rothstein, who I mentioned at the beginning, who was he was sort of the founding father of organized crime in the <laughs> United States, and and he, his four proteges uh, at, at before the beginning of um, prohibition were uh, Lucky Luciano, uh, Meyer Lansky, Frank Costello, and Bugsy Siegel, who were all friends uh, in their teenage years. So there was always an interconnection between. Um, Jews and Italians uh, in, in, in the mob. A and it, it, it was interesting because what a lot of people don't realize is, is while there are five mafia families in New York, uh, Lucky Luciano and uh, Meyer Lansky established something called the National Crime Syndicate, which, which really was over the mafia. So mafia bosses like Lucky Luciano and Albert Anastasia and Carlo Gambino sat on the National Crime Syndicate. The National Crime Syndicate had authority over not only the five mafia families of New York, but mafia families all over the country. And so when they decided to kill somebody, they had to get permission from the National Crime Syndicate. And so, for example, one of the things that I uncovered was that when um, Albert Anastasia was assassinated in a barber shop in 1957 in New York, um, they had to get the okay from Meyer Lansky, who was in, 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 in Miami, and he agreed that Anastasia should be, should be killed. What was the reason for that? Um, it, it, it goes, it, 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 it's a very sort of complicated in a way. Um, when Lucky Luciano had his own crime family, and when Lucky Luciano got out of prison in 1946, he was deported to Italy, he appointed, um, his underboss, uh, Vito Genovese, to, to become uh, the boss of, of his crime family. Vito Genovese was indicted for murder, and rather than facing the murder charge, he went off to Italy. Uh, while Luciano was in prison, not, not when Luciano got out, this was in the 1930s. A and when, when uh, Vito Genovese uh, went to Italy, uh, Frank Costello, who, who was the um, consigliere of, of that family, became the boss of the family. And uh, Frank Costello uh, was hated by Vito Genovese. Vito Genovese did not like the fact that they, would, that they had Jews that they did business with. And he used to refer to them as the little thieves. And, and, and uh, Frank Costello and Monte Luciano looked down upon him for having this uh, prejudice. Um, Frank Costello was married to a Jewish woman and um, uh, Lucky Luciano and Meyer Lansky were like brothers, and they could finish each other's sentences. Um, but um, 
eventually Vito Genovese was able to come back to, uh, to New York. And he wanted to get rid of uh, uh, Frank Costello. He wanted to become the boss. And uh, he arranged for um, uh, Frank Costello to be shot by uh, Joey Gallo uh, uh, in, in, the, in the barber shop. Um, and um, then um, uh, was a, a friend of um, Lucky Luciano, and he stood in the way of, um, of uh, Vito Genovese becoming head of that crime family. And at the same time, Meyer Lansky was running these uh, gambling casinos in uh, Havana, and the mob, all the mobsters owned a piece of, of these casinos. And Albert, An uh, Albert Anastasia was not happy with, with the amount of money he was receiving, and he wanted more. He was threatening Meyer Lansky. So when um, Vito Genovese decided to kill Albert Anastasia, Meyer Lansky agreed because he was getting rid of the pawn in his side and wanted more money. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Where was he killed? In, in, a, in a barber shop oh, in Park, 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 Central. Central. Park Central. The same place yeah. where Arnold Rothstein was right. killed. Yeah. It seems like a, a good place to kill mobsters. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm going to leave with the right uh, perception here. Because you're <coughs> vilifying many of my boyhood heroes. I'm sorry, but... <laughs> yeah, and, and I just wonder, you, you referred to to speak science as, as an entertainment. Am I to assume that, that guys like Billy Pep and the Featherweight and, and the Dale Graziano fights and, and the Archie Moore fights and the great heavyweight fights that, that the proponents of those or a majority no. were, were fixed? No. The, the, the Graziano and Dale fights were not fixed. They were brutal and, 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 and very bloody fights and, and they were not fixed at all. Um, and Willie Pep was a great fighter, as far as I know, none of his fights. How, how many of these fights were fixed? A, a, a lot of the middleweight and welterweight fights that took place in Madison Square Garden were fixed. And, and, and I mean, Frankie Carbo and Frank Palermo and Jim Norris had, just had so much control. N not only of, of the fixed fights, for example, there was this great boxing trainer, Ray Arcel, who started something called the Saturday Night Fights from the Boston Arena. And uh, Carbo and Norris and uh, Palermo were very upset about that. They didn't want these fights to take place because they want they controlled the television rights for Madison Square Garden, which had Friday night fights and Wednesday night fights. So they threatened Arcel to stop this, and Arcel wouldn't do it. So one night while Arcel was on his way to the Boston uh, Arena, some guy came up behind him with a lead pipe wrapped in newspaper and hit him over the head and fractured his skull. Mm -hmm. And he, he was in the hospital for about four weeks. And he was told that he'd better stay out of boxing. This was the end of his career. He didn't come back to boxing until he was asked, desperately asked, to please train uh, Roberto Duran, which was, I think, 14 or 17 years later. And, 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 and he didn't take any money for that. And, and um, um, uh, but Frankie Carbo, in fact, ended the Saturday Night Fights from Boston. So I mean, his, his, his power and, and, and his ability to control things was just extraordinary. If Al Weil was connected with the mob, I don't think and anything that he was connected with had anything to do with Rocky Marciano's fights. I don't. I don't think Marciano's fights were, were were fixed. However, you know th there is there was a um, th uh, there's a movie being made now with a heavyweight fighter named Harry Hat who um, was in a Nazi concentration camp during the war. He had to fight uh, for the entertainment of, 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 of the SS guards. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he had 70 fights while he was in a concentration camp. He won every single fight. And he came to New York after, his, uh, after he was released from the concentration camps. And he had several fights. And his last fight was with uh, Rocky Marciano at, at some arena in, in Westchester. What was the name? What was his name? Harry Haft, H A F T. And and um, <laughs> the guy who made the movie Bugsy, what was it? He's that director. Um, he, he, he's making the, the Warren Beatty. No, no, the director. Oh. Uh, he, he's making a movie of right now about Harry Haft. Harry, ha his son wrote a book about. Yeah, he did die in it too. Right. 
Yeah, yeah Barry Levinson, right. He's, he's making a movie about Harry Hap. Harry Hap told his son that before that fight, he was told that he better lose to Marciano because Marciano is going to be our next heavyweight champion, and we don't want you to knock him out. And, and, and he was told that if he did, he would be killed. Oh. And, 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 and after that, he left boxing. <laughs> oh, the grocery He's already in that against Marciano anyway. I don't know, you know, Marciano was an interesting fighter. You know, if you look at Marciano, he's very short. He had very short arms. Um, the, the fighters he won against, Joe Lewis, Archie Moore, those people that were way past their prime. Uh, um, you know, I doubt he could have beat Joe Lewis uh, in Joe Lewis's prime. Joe Lewis is unbeatable. Um, and, and in order for uh, uh, Marciano to win, he had to get in under these fighters, get in under their long arms, and he had to kind of punch from them from the bottom, and, and he was punching guys who were really, I mean, some of them were old men by boxing standards at the time that he won. You know, you look at Balding Joe Lewis and, 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 and Archie Moore, who was a, a brilliant uh, a fighter. He, he was very smart. He knew how to maneuver around the ring brilliantly. Right, right. So my, father's, my father grew up with a, a close friend who was growing up as a boxer named Dave Simon. Who lost to Joe Lewis twice in 1941 and 1942. He beat Joe, Joe Bolcott and it, it knocked him out in order to become a contender, a heavyweight contender to fight Joe Lewis. You know, and, and, and if you've ever seen the movie um, On the Waterfront, he plays one of the thugs uh, in the movie. He's a big, ugly guy, mm -hmm. about six foot four, about 260 pounds. Mm -hmm. He was a very nice man. I met him a couple of times. Yes. And how did you inform him? Come, come, come with him to this. I mean, he's very successful now. Very he, he was legitimate also. Yeah. He was a legitimate fighter. You don't mention Don King at all. He had nothing to do with any of this? He was a monster unto himself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I mean, he's a gangster. He's yeah. a killer. Uh, <laughs> but uh, for various legal reasons, I didn't uh, uh, go into that because uh, the editor was a little nervous about uh, libel suits. Oh, from him. But from people that he was connected with and so forth. And, you know, if you mention him, you have to mention someone else, and, and you know, maybe that person is. And, and you know, a, a libel suit may not go anywhere, but it, but it could delay publication of the book. Interesting. So all the people that you inferred were are dead. Except for Sammy Gravano. Right. And then all I did was repeat his testimony. I, I, I have a whole chapter in there. His testimony is very revealing, it's fascinating. And the questions asked by the senators are, are, are very uh, interesting, and, and his responses are very honest. He, he, they, he was told that, that if any of his uh, answers to the Senate were not true, that it, that it could jeopardize his position in the witness protection program. Will you be selling any of these books uh, I, I'll be selling all of them. Uh, I, I, I hope you'll buy them. <laughs> A a a a any other questions? I have the books right here. And, and I'll be happy to autograph them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.